Hi kids. I again wanted to um, go over some of the things that you read um, in association with James Joyce's The Dead, but I did want to kind of go over a plan to help you go through the essay. And now we've talked about these things all year. This is review. So I want you to just um, kind of think all this together. Don't feel like you have to stop every single step and go, oh, now what was that again? You need to, this really should be internalized by now. But let's, let's go through this. So um, we're looking again at what we've been doing all year, which is style analysis. Remember the what, the how, the why. What is the writer saying? Literally, what's, what's the writer saying? What's the plot of the story? What's the plot of what's going on? Um, you won't include that whole thing in your essay, but you do need to go back to that for support. How did the writer say it? What literary techniques? Ooh, I misspelled that. What literary techniques did the writer use and why did the writer say it? Uh, which is, takes us to meaning, which is something you have to do on every essay. We said that a thousand times over. Um, and remember to, in, in your organization, as you're putting it together, remember that in the introduction, you need to answer the question. In the body paragraphs, you need to see how the author develops the idea that you put in your introduction. And your conclusion would be a nice wrap up about why this is important. Now, that's not going to be a you should statement. It's not that. This isn't, um, you know, you should be nice to other people. It's not that kind of statement. And we'll look at um, an example. Okay, remember, as you read, certain categories will pop out at you. Okay, this piece is talking about freedom. Um, it is also talking about love, and it is also dealing with the issue of time. And so those categories should pop out as you read. And then you want to look to see where such devices, remember you've got to bring the devices in, such as detail, imagery, diction, figurative language, and syntax take you. Okay, how did that develop the idea again? All right, stick to the topic. It's called topic adherence, just like glue. So when you're going to, first of all, as, as you know, you're going to de deconstruct a prompt. What is it asking you to do? What are the tasks, plural, it's asking you to do? then read the passage, then look back at the prompt, then read the passage again and annotate. Stick to the prompt, refer to it as you write, keep it in front of you as you're writing, make sure that you're not drifting, okay? So remember that that planning is all gonna be done in the first 10 minutes, you should not go beyond that. All right, and then as we said, looking at the category, what ideas pop out, and then this is the big part, what can you best address? What can you address most easily, most naturally, most comfortably, given the details in the text? Okay, I really see where this is dealing, to me this is dealing with freedom the most, and this is what it's saying, and how can I support that? Because remember, you have to go back to support it with the text. So look at what the text gives you. It's like opening pre presents. It's right there, okay? All right, so the introduction. Again, you're gonna identify the text and the author if it's given. There's no room here in the introduction for vague statements, okay? If you're using words like things and stuff anywhere, or if you say, uh, the writer does this to make a point, well, mm, okay, what's the point? Okay, the reader should know you understand the text and the task within that introduction. Remember, that's where you answer the question specifically. That's what sets the direction and the tone of your paper. It's like a roadmap. This is what I'm going to be proving. Okay, so again, ask these questions. Did you identify the text and author? Is your thesis statement clear? Did you mention the techniques you will address? Does it speak to the author's purpose? all that together, okay? Your tag statement, thesis, within the thesis, techniques, what's the writer's point? <clears throat> Your body paragraphs, you wanna put specific references in there. You can paraphrase some, I would definitely embed quotations, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Use only details that support the claim. You've probably taken notes while you've been annotating, hopefully, uh, some of those details might support, might not support what you actually decide to say. 
So you can jettison those and just deal with the ones that support what you're saying. Embed five to nine word quotations. It's really, it really gets heavy to go beyond the nine. You don't want to include one and two full sentences. Just choose the uh, meaty parts. Quotations, embed those into sentences of your commentary. When you do that, <clears throat> whatever those uh, short little phrases are or clauses, put quotation marks around them, okay? Avoid redundancy in your wording by using synonyms. So if you've decided to write on the topic of freedom, there are lots of synonyms for that. Words like liberty, words like autonomy. That way you're not going freedom, 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 and your reader's not going, oh, lands will this kid get off this word. word. And then use meaningful transitions, words and phrases. On the other hand, conversely, uh, in addition, moreover, okay? Look at what you're using them for, make sure they suit that purpose. Okay, I wanna look at an embedded quotation, okay? This is from um, East of Eden, which uh, many of you read. So all of Hamilton was tough and resilient. From the age of 18, she taught every subject to every grade at the Peachtree School. She also served as a counselor and nurse, sewing up knife cuts after a fight and watching for weakness of character. So um, I took those words straight from the book. The word was sewed, so I changed it to sewing and it was watched. So those brackets show that I changed the uh, tense of the word, but I still kept the idea there. So that does go within the quotation marks. And then I follow up with more commentary. Uh, her confidence and irrepressible strength of mind uh, should have been benefited not only herself, but her students, which in turn benefited the town. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna need to go back and change that. So her confidence and irrepressible, irrepressible strength of mind benefited not only herself, uh, could, you could just say, but also the town. That way you don't have the repetition of the word benefited. You may decide you want it for emphasis. and eh, I'm not sure it, uh, it works to use it twice here. So, um, but at any rate, remember it is a timed right. So here we go. Okay, conclusion. Do not say in conclusion or all in all or to sum up, things like that. In the conclusion, it's going to be a natural paragraph that brings a sense of closure. Do not sum up your main points. They've, they have already heard them, okay? And if you're going to go back to the thesis, which is not a bad idea, don't repeat it verbatim. Put it in other words. Bring in a little bit more to it. Um, you can use the techniques, you can bring up a universal truth, which is what also a thesis statement typically is. And you can, you know, again, it's natural to kind of circle back to that idea. So let's show you what that looks like. <clears throat> Here's, uh, this is from uh, Othello. Uh, this is a conclusion. Iago's cruelty is the cause of everyone's, including his own, downfall but he himself is not the only man responsible. His cruelty reveals more about his victims than it does about himself. It is shown through Desdemona that it is not necessary to become cruel when one has had cruelty done on himself, but many characters still fall prey to this. One cruel action fuels another, and the evil prevails when one has at least a hint of evil in himself. Cruelty functions in many ways, but it is nearly always guaranteed to bring more cruelty. There is a universal truth, the part in red, the part that applies, remember, to all people of all times, of all places, okay? It's beautifully done, uh, concluding paragraph here. Okay, let's look at a circle back. It's where you circle back to the same idea. So in the in introduction, you have, in the excerpt from Maxine Clare's Cherry Bomb, the adult narrator recounts her memories of her fifth grade summer. Through the narrator's story of her private box and her cherry bomb, Claire captures the innocence and youthfulness of childhood. Okay, now the conclusion. By the ending paragraph where the narrator says she kept the cherry bomb as a memento of good times, suggests the importance of embracing and treasuring those childhood moments and memories when all that was dangerous and scary in the world was the hairy man and when all your secrets could be safely tucked away in a cigar box. So they came back to the idea of childhood 
and innocence, but they eloquently uh, reworded and gave, you know, showed what that looks like. So these are uh, two really nice conclusions. And um, I will, I think we're done here. I, if you have questions, please bring them up and I will see you at our Q&A. Bye.